Mary Jean Bell is the murderer of two to three victims from May to June of 1985. His victim profile includes 17-year-old Sharon Faye Smith, who went by Sherry, and 10-year-old Deborah May Helmick. His methodology includes asphyxia and suffocation in Lexington County, South Carolina. As of October 4, 1996, he was electrocuted by electrocution in South Carolina. Welcome back to the True Crime Lounge Podcast. I do have a merch shop for all your true crime gear. I also have a Patreon to receive early access to episodes scheduled to come out. I also have a merch shop, like I said, for all your true crime gear. Come on, guys. Help a girl out. I work two jobs. Please, guys. You have no idea what that would mean to me. But you don't have to. For any updates on my channel or podcast, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. With that being said, let's dive into today's episode. Today, we're going to cover a case. Um... To cover the case of Larry Jean Bell. And this case inspired a cool case episode, which is one of my favorite shows growing up. Um, he was a double murder- murderer in Lexington County, South Carolina. He was official, especially infamous because he forced his victims to write a, quote, last will and testament, unquote, before they were murdered and taunted their parents by telephone. So, you're probably wondering, why? what makes this guy so special? Well, he was born in Ralph, Alabama, has three sisters and one brother. The family reportedly moved around a lot, and with Bell attending Air Claire High School in Columbia, South Carolina, from 1965 to 1967, the family moved to Mississippi, where Bell graduated high school and took training as an electrician. He returned to Columbia, and married and had one son. He joined the Marines in 1970, but he was discharged that same year due to a knee injury, and he suffered accidentally shot himself while cleaning a gun. That following year, he worked as a prison guard in the Department of Corrections for one month. Bell and his family moved to Rock Hill, South Carolina in 1972, and the couple divorced and... 1976. Let's talk about his victims now. He would kidnap 17-year-old Sharon Sherry Faith Smith at gunpoint at the end of her driveway in Flat Springs Road on May 31st, 1985. Her car was found running and the door was open. Her body was later found in Saluda County, South Carolina. He then kidnapped 10-year-old Deborah Mae Helmick near Old Pacifical Road in Richland County, South Carolina. But, Bell was also a suspect in the 1984 disappearance of Sandy Elaine Cornette in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, Cornette was the girlfriend of one of Bell's co-workers. Let's talk about his arrest and trial now. So, the day after her funeral, Bell was arrested and throughout the largest manhunt in South Carolina, he made eight telephone calls to the Smith family, often speaking with Dawn, but eventually gave exact directions to the location of both the bodies. And during his six-hour testimony at trial, he continuously blurted out bizarre comments and carried on with non-stop theatrics. He also refused to give answers by just rambling on and on. Silence is golden was his favorite when he didn't want to answer a question. And at one time, he even yelled, I would like Don E. Smith to marry me. Bell would claim that that he was Jesus Christ even to his death. He also would choose to die by electric chair instead of lethal injection. But but he was also a suspect in the 1984 disappearance of Sandy Elaine Cornette from Charlotte, North Carolina. Bell was the last prisoner in South Carolina to be executed by electrocution until James Nell Tucker was executed in 2004 for double murders of Rosalie Dolly Oakley and Shannon Lynn Mellon. Now, CCS would do the movie, the movie called Nightmare in Columbia County and then portray the events of the Sherry Smith murder. Um... So, when the state of South Carolina executed the convicted murderer um, in 1996, Hilda and Bob Smith sat along in their living room watching the news. 
um, and we prayed for him, Bob said, as um, he about the man who had abducted and killed their teenage daughter 11 years later. And he felt sympathy for his parents because he was their child. But there was no closure when they executed him, and they couldn't bring Sherry back. Now, what touched the Smiths as they watched the news coverage was the, fa- was the sight of their daughter's um, friends scattered outside the prison gates, not protesting for, for or against the death penalty, but simply light candles in Sherry's memory. And that meant so much to him. Let's talk about the, the night Sherry vanished. He brings up, he talks about his senior picture and how it's taken months before her premature death. And locking into the memory forever. And laugh, and the laughing eyes and radiant smile was so perfectly reflected in, in her chipper, lively spirit. Now, a break in Sherry's loving routine is what tipped um, Bob off. Um, that might be, something might be wrong on that last day in May of 1985. In his home office in the rural outskirts of Columbia, Bob glanced briefly out the window and noticed Sherry pulling up with a set, pulling up to their 750 tree-lined driveway, foot line, foot tree-lined driveway. A few minutes later, he realized she hadn't come in yet, and she also came and gave her daddy a hug. He would look out the window again to see that her car was still by the roadside mailbox, and at first he thought she had run across the street into the woods, but because Sherry was a rare form of diabetes, sometimes down large amounts of water and then quickly had to find relief. But when some but he went out to look for her and couldn't find her, he trembled with dread. Forty two minutes later he would call the police. The police officers would sit in front of Smith's living room, suggesting that Sherry, like others of Vanish Teen, had simply ran away. But her parents dismissed that notion at once, saying, I'm her mom and I know my child. What should have been a festive high school graduation quickly turned into a grim search party, fooling up hundreds of volunteers of local states, um, of local state and federal law enforcement, and the kidnapper called terrified Smith several times, never asking for ransom, just coldly teasing them about Sherry's clothing to prove that he really had her. Then came Sherry's letter, a handwritten last will and testament, filled with courage. I'll be with my father now, as she consoled her family. Please do not come, become hard to upset. Everything works out for the good in those that love the Lord. Romans 8.28 The same verse Bob and Hilda immediately acclaimed when they realized Sherry was missing. But on June 5th, they received a call that gave directions to a spot 16 miles where they where the killer had left her body, and they admitted admit they challenged God's goodness. Now, her abduction hurtled the Smiths, and up plumbed the well lost not just the horrible witnesses, but for 28 days, Sherry's disappearance until Bell's kept capture. Bob, like, was, Bob said the police were great, and that he asked for 28 days, we lived in fear. And Bell's ripping out of family lived in a searing wound of Hilda's soul. After Bell was arrested, officers brought in Hilda and an older daughter, Dawn, to confront him, hoping to elicit a spontaneous confession. When Hilda met Bell at the jail, she forgave him to his face, said Bob, still amazed at his wife's strength and mercy. Um... And it took Bob another seven months to, to to reach his own point of forgiveness at the urging of a friend. And he went on to, went behind him in a secluded barn and just blasted out. And he stressed, I was really, really mad and I wanted to scream and holler at God. My friend said, go ahead, he can take it. And it was such a relief thing to do. 
but forgiveness didn't instantly abolish the pain, particularly when occurring media coverage and the court proceedings that forced Bob and Hilda um, to relive the events and expose dis discrepancies, discrepancies in the treatment. Because of excessive publicity in Columbia, a trial took place a hundred miles in Monk's Corner, where the Smiths had to spend two weeks in an awful motel room, detached from their familiar surroundings and supportive friends. And during Bob's testimony, the judge and defense attorney often curtly cut him off mid-answer, said they reprimanded me. Now, through 11 years of appeals and since the execution, the Smiths have resisted the efforts to get involved in either championing and opposing the death penalty. Um, a few years later, after Sherry's much publicized homicide, Bob, who served as the chaplain for the local sheriff's department, accompanied officers to notify um, couples about their daughter's murder. If stressed by the news, the parents wanted nothing to do with the messengers until Bob reintroduced himself, not as the chaplain, but as Sherry Smith's dad. Instantly, the other father who wrapped his brawny arms around a man um, in the room was truly understanding the agony he was feeling. Unaccustomed to the limelight, Hilda has several invitations to speak at women's groups and church audiences and to begin about her spiritual journey. She was writing, writing a book called The Rose of Sherry. The Smiths also serve on the advisory board in the South Carolina chapter of the Neighbors Who Care, Prison's Fellowship Ministry to Crime Victims. In April, the Smiths participated in a Neighbors Who Care banquet in Columbia. Featuring guest speakers that, like Debbie Morris, and for years, Debbie was widely one of the unnamed 16-year-old vic unnamed victims in Madisonville, Louisiana, who had their kidnapped and repeatedly raped by Robert Lee Willie and Joseph Vaccaro during the summer weekend 1980. Another woman immortalized the crime, Sister Helen Prejean, who, author of The Dead Man Walking, who author, who offered spiritual guidance to Willie before his execution, and her book became an Academy Award-winning film. Through the offender's name and some facts that would change the height and the theatrical value. In 1988, Debbie wrote a book, Forgiving the Dead Man Walking, Walking Given a Victim's Gripping Perspective into the Pain and Part in the Missing from Prejean's Account. Today, her shows her stories with very audiences. At the beginning of the crisis, Debbie would um, remain controlled. Immediately after the two assailants abducted her and her boyfriend, Mark, um, eventually they let Debbie go. They dragged Mark into the woods, stabbed and burned him, and then shot the 20-year-old, leaving him dead. Her acute attention to detail enabled the police to find Mark, who amazingly survived the assault. Now, in 1984, during the first year of the Louisiana State at uh, LSU, Debbie learned that Willie's execution date had been set to December 28th. And everything. And the night before his execution, Debbie finally realized that even Willie's death would not end in a debilitating torment, and her ability to move on was tied in something beyond the offender's punishment, and that God was saying something to her, and you've got to deal with it, so you're ignoring God. Having taken that first step to forgiveness, she finally slept. And the next morning, after learning that Willie's electrocution had occurred just after midnight, she felt numb, and there was no joy inside her. But she was wrong because his his face still invaded her dreams. She still had the anger, um, anger and resentment directed toward God, and she needed to forgive him, not because he had done anything wrong to her, but because he she needed a way to release the resentment that had built up in her, and God abandoning her. Debbie talks openly about the crime in this aftermath because 
She thinks it's so important to understand the kinds of evil and pain that Jesus can heal. Now, the story of Debbie basically summarizes the story of God, is the story of God's grace. While her assailant's crimes certainly warranted punishment, she believes that justice didn't heal her. Um, forgiveness did. Now, in the audience, Bob and Hilda Smith nod knowingly, but those left behind memory is enduring connection to their loved ones. Alright, that is it for this episode. Um, I will see y'all next time as we talk about um, Bernadette Prati. In this case, um, it's about jealousy and greed. Alright, y'all have a great day.